So I am a very seat of the pants author. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways in which that has been fine for me. Um, but what I've learned in the past, like probably six months, a year is you can't do it entirely. I, I pulled away from that really hard when I first started writing a lot of fiction because I had seen so many people get caught up in world building that they did not actually get around to writing any stories. And then over the past, you know, seven novels, I just finished up seven. I realized that there were, are failings. I needed to actually stop every so often and go, where am I at? Where am I going? What's going to make sense to get me from point A to point B? And I really needed to get that down on paper more. This is the Crit RPG Podcast, your one-stop shop for everything Lit RPG, Progression Fantasy, and Royal Road. Hi everyone and welcome to the Crit RPG Podcast, the only podcast where the guests butter up the host before the show starts. With me today is RC Joshua, who has been buttering me up before the show started. Um, but yeah, we've been recording one hour and nine minutes of bonus material that you can find on Patreon. But if you don't, well, stick around. And we're going to be talking for at least an hour more about writing and all that kind of stuff. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Um, it's late here. Um, but that, it's that, here. that's my fault for living on the wrong continent. Yes, um, you're living in the past. We've talked about this too. Um, Yes, it is. It is unfortunate. I can give you next week's lot of numbers if you want. <laughs> well, I, no, I want to earn it. Okay. That's good. That's a spirit. There you go. Suffering. Um, How's it going all right. Where you're at. Um, so, as I said before, uh, I am for once actually short on time when we're doing these things. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we need to... Be very, very focused. <laughs> focused on this podcast. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyway, um, tell us about your stories. Pitch us your stories. Why and how do you write those stories? Okay. Um, so most of my stories come from a point of view of really focusing in on the escapism um, mm -hmm. part of lit RPG. So at the beginning of every story, I'm setting up a character who has a problem in mm -hmm. our current Earth. Um, mm -hmm. So for... The first book I wrote, Dead World Isekai, it's a character who is having their life cut short. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a character who has cancer, who dies of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and when they get Isekai reincarnated, transmigrated, mm -hmm. however you think of it, um, they're initially make, given a promise. I'm sending you to a beautiful planet, a garden planet, someplace that you can actually work and see your work grow and it's going to be this beautiful place and when he actually gets there it's that promise is broken to him he's on a completely barren world dead world um so but starting from that place of here's this person who is a lot like you um here's this person who has a real problem that this world promises to solve um mm -hmm. and then having that promise broken um, I think is what I was focusing on when I wrote that one. Mm -hmm. um, How to Survive, which was the second series, um, focused on a character who was not um, who was not as successful as he should be. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people who read lit RPG have what at least Americans call smart kid syndrome, where they were <laughs> very promising young people for mm -hmm. whom the world didn't pan out quite like it seemed it was. Um, mm -hmm. that character came from that place and then moved into a world where there was more opportunity for success, less broken mm -hmm. promises, but like something to mm -hmm. work, you could pour his work towards that would matter. Um, and those more relevant for the third book and just give a reason for those two dead world was written in a time where I was horrifyingly depressed. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, what are you working on next? And I said, a guy who's going to be alone with broken promises in a dark, dreary, empty world, <laughs> struggling to survive. Ah, uh, yes. And I was going through that as I wrote that book. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, How to Survive was more about like my past, just like jobs that didn't fit and a world mm -hmm. that hadn't worked 
worked out quite like I had planned as far as success went. Um, and then the most recent book, which is Demon World Boba Shop, is completely fluffy, nice uh, slice of life stuff, which I chose to write because I was, you know, it's writing, writing game is hard. Um, yeah. And I was starting to get stressed out with a lot wow. of it and had to focus in on a guy who started out on earth in a stressy way, working too hard, and then went to a place where nothing bad, really bad things can happen, but everything always turns out right. Yeah. You know? so, I feel that's so hard. Mm -hmm. That's so that, uh, hmm. That's at least what drove those premises. Like the books mm -hmm. are long and involved in chapter by chapter. Why I'm writing what I write changes a lot, but I, I mm -hmm. think that's what drove those three books specifically um, where I started out from and why I decided to write it. I can relate to all of them. I, except that I didn't, I didn't write the broken, broken promise one yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, well I did, but it's not on Royal road. Um, but um, I, I have taken down some notes um, <laughs> because actually I think there's so much to talk about here. Um, but the, the, the demon boba shop um, one, uh, I was disappointed that you didn't call it a bubble of life story. Um, <laughs> I'll put it in a blurb somewhere. That, please do. Um, <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the blubber. <laughs> anyway, um, no, but I've been thinking about this for a while ever since since one of my guests mentioned like, hey, is there any like spiritual lit RPG, right? Um, and you mentioned this thing of, well, someone dying of, like the premise of one of your books is like someone dies of cancer and then um, gets sent into another world. And I wrote down like this very short thing called like reincarnation myth, right? Um, now I'm going to like do a little bit of a detour. There's this guy called... Let me just get his name. Ah. David Atterbury. I Not to be confused with David Attenborough. <laughs> who, wrote, who spent his life um, in academia writing literature, literature and write papers about fantasy literature. And he basically postulated that fantasy literature is modern myth-making and just as necessary as stories about the real world that are kind of like depressing a little bit. Um, mm. Like one thing that I always find very interesting is that people call Neil Gaiman's books um, mystical realism when it's just urban fantasy, mm. right? But no, it's urban fantasy if you can get it for a dime. Like that's the that's the whole difference. Um, but um, there is a lot of these isekai novels that we write are takes on, you know, paradise, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it's, they're it's takes on Valhalla, mm -hmm. right? So I thought. Like, have you integrated stuff like that in, in your story? Like, because you've, you started on this, on this, on this premise. I, yeah, I mean, I am, I, I, I think it's mostly subtext rather mm -hmm. than explicit text. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm a, I'm a relatively religious person, um, mm -hmm. in, in real life. Um, mm -hmm. and that concept of like this promise of something that fixes things after your life is over, even if your life doesn't go well, here's this thing that will eventually come in and fix it. And it'll all turn out mm -hmm. right in the end is mm -hmm. easy for me to suffuse into it. Cause I've grown up in that particular, um, what for some people would be a mythos. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I don't think it's necessarily me going, I, I never hint that those mm -hmm. people are not fully alive again. If, if yeah. that makes sense. But it is something where it's like, I recently rewatched the show, The Good Place. Oh, I love that show. It's so good. I think about it constantly when I'm writing these books, because so much mm. of it is, what if you showed up to this place and it was different than you expected? Like it appeared to be one yeah. thing, especially with Dead World. Um, mm. Like you, you were promised heaven and here mm. is a form of hell. And what can you do to fix that? 
mm-hmm. um, was was definitely a huge premise there. So I, so I think about it when I write it. I don't want to say it's an explicit thing in the books because I think if you went looking for it, you probably wouldn't find it. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, I, I, I think about it at the time. That's yeah, that's a very good point. So, I mean, thinking about these thinking about isekai war uh, right and the idea of that being like paradisical the th- scene always comes to mind is um the first scene in he who fires with monsters because um jason gets pulled to this other world and this is just stereotypical this is just like for most other isekai novels right it almost always starts in the glade yeah you, you right? have to have calm calm place to but he's a, he's mm-hmm. almost immediately because it's a glade in a cultist compound, if I remember right. Exactly. And it's like it's a little bit like that, right? It's it's Garden of Eden, but just a veneer of it. Right? Yeah. It's actually in the middle of a desert. And there's like the first thing he sees is like this like wild rabbit just tries to kill him. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's it's always that that thing of like we've been promised paradise. And we're not getting it, right? Yeah. So why not? What's up? And um, the other example of this, like if, if this is, hey, um, rewards in the next world, right? Then system apocalypses are the exact opposite. Yeah. Because that is, you, have, you are trapped in this world. There is nothing after it, or maybe there is, we don't know. But... If you're thinking about it, everything in every system apocalypse ever is just taking reality and cranking it up to 11. Whether that's by Mort, uh, whether that's Dungeon Caller Carl, um, whether it's Apocalypse Me, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on, on more here. Um, How to Survive at the End of the World by R.C. Joshua. Oh, yeah. Well, that, yeah, by R.C. Joshua, right? That's, Great contemporary yeah. genius, R.C. Joshua. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I, I hope I hope I get I get that kind of podcast someday, um, right? But that's that's all about like the absurdity of what we experience in our real lives, and then kind of cranking that like up to a maximum, where suddenly people always giggle about the the subway level mm-hmm. uh, in DCC, but I I never I have never seen something more. Like that that is just genius on so many levels. Mm-hmm. Like the whole like being trapped in a job commute thing, coupled with like addiction to drugs, coupled with like the murderousness of like the murderousness of being trapped in a machine. Oh, yeah. And and like at the end of the line, in many ways, it just all ends in a void. Like God damn it, Matt, who hurt you, but also thank you, right? It's, yeah. And as a tool too, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for people who can do this. Well, taking something like that, that is instantly relatable and understandable mm-hmm. to the reader and taking all the elements of that, that let them shortcut um, mm-hmm. understanding issues and let them shortcut, mm-hmm. like, this is what's going on. This is what's happening mm-hmm. and still making that into its own thing. Um, mm-hmm. Still making that into because it's not just a subway level. Like mm-hmm. he could have done the same story beats in a ton of different settings, but the subway lets him focus on the cool stuff. Like yep. the sub, yep. him saying, "This is a subway thing. You understand what that is? Here's where it's different and neat." Is mm-hmm. a whole whole thing that I really respect. Mm. Yeah, I like I like the I like subway. It's really good. Jumping into the next question. Mm-hmm. what's the best advice you've ever gotten as a writer? Oh, so this isn't even from a fiction guy. This is from a nonfiction writer who I disagree with on almost every point he writes about, but he's a tremendous writer. His name's Freddie DeBoer. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's not super duper famous, but he's known. Mm-hmm. And he put out a guide for writers who wanted to write nonfiction mostly. And his mm-hmm. advice was, the field is so incredibly crowded now with different writers that mm-hmm. you're going to have and you're going to have people come in who will tell you in that crowded field that what you should do is follow these 
hundred rules, these 20 rules, like here's things you never do, here's things you always do. And he says, you should flat out ignore every single one of them. And I absolutely agree with that because we're all rolling the dice on, I think, will we find people who read our stuff and enjoy it? And they have so many choices now that the only thing that you can really offer people is the way that you yourself are weird. And it's, it, it's not a guarantee. Like you may not find people who identify with the specific way you're weird. It may not find its audience, but if it finds, if it is going to find an audience and it is going to do really well, like dungeon crawler, Carl did not find its audience by following a lot of the specific rules for making very standard cookie cutter fiction. Um, yeah. he was with yeah. monsters and they did it because those were the books that they were supposed to write. You can mm. feel them in it, I think. Mm. Um, and they, and leaning into your personal weird, I think is, it's not a guarantee of success, but it is necessary, I think, for it. Yeah. Gar not a guarantee of success, by the way, very, very apt, right? We were talking about um, other books before, but uh, yeah. Um, like, and also, like, again, like, we've also talked about trying to gauge success of books on Railroad versus on Kindle Unlimited. Mm -hmm. And while there, is, while there is, like, an overlap, um, I think Red Bruno... Uh, the owner, uh, one of the owners of Athon was the first person to really capitalize on that. Um, where he discussed, like, I, the people who are on Royal Road have pretty much the same taste as the people who are reading books on Kindle Unlimited. So there's, like, a, you, can, you can make some assumptions there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how Athon started. So just because you're writing weird stuff doesn't mean that people are going to like it, right? You got you to gotta find the right people for your book to, mm -hmm. like, people that would like your book basically yeah. um so i am yeah I'm, I'm still thinking about lots of stuff um in this case and um, i'll add to that that sometimes those people don't don't exist yet yeah um and sometimes your brand of weird is the right thing and your writing skill isn't there but yeah the people who, I, I mean, there are plenty of stories of people who have written five books, 10 books before they, mm -hmm. they got themselves to the place where it could hit and they found the audience where it could hit. And mm -hmm. then they did quite real well. It's really harsh of you to shout out small indie authors like Brandon Sanderson like that. He's, he's done well since. Yeah, I think so too. He's a, he's a rising star. <laughs> yes. Yes. He's right. like, I, th I think he's like, like he's going supernova pretty soon, but um, yeah. The the thing that you said about rules, though, is, and I want to align this. There's wisdom at the core of every, every rule, but oh, yeah. right, rules are bad. Like all rules are bad, but sometimes they're helpful. The, yeah. it, it's like show don't tell. Like that thing has like so many layers that you need to unwrap before you actually understand this. But it's also good advice for people on different levels of different skill sets if you keep thinking about it. Yeah. So people at the start of when they're writing, some people go like, he felt bad. Like, can you show us how, how bad that was, right? So you can say like, it felt like he was being stung by bees in his stomach. Well, and the the American jazz sort of metaphor that they use is you mm -hmm. have to know the rules before you can break them sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I, and I have seen, and I think we've all seen, um, people who have said, hey, come read my writing. And you go read it, and they're trying to break the rules without knowing them. Yeah. And it's some of the worst stuff you'll read sometimes. Um, and, and, and I say that brutally because I love these people mm -hmm. and they're trying. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, like there's, there's, there's mistakes on both sides. Some people over mm -hmm. fixate on the rules yeah. and then they can't do anything. And I, I think the people who are really successful are the people who have a good enough grasp of the rules, but also mm -hmm. have that self-confidence to, to then try something different. There's a concept of shuhari. Um, it is from. I think it's Chinese or Japanese martial arts. Uh, I, I'm never quite sure. Um, and it's been wildly used in agile coaching circles. 
Um, the idea is that it's first you learn the rule, then you, um, then you adapt the rule and then you are the rule, right? Mm -hmm. So learn the rule, break the rule, be the rule. Um, and it's very important to know where you are in whatever aspect you're doing. It's basically like a thing that tries to avoid the Dunning-Kruger effect, mm -hmm. um, where Dunning-Kruger means you yeah. frame of think, reference. yeah, if, if you're not good at something, you think you're better than you actually are. Um, and um, think of Karate Kid, for example, right? Mm -hmm. At the start, he's like, yeah, just go paint that fence. He's, he's like, what? Like, wash the car, right? Wax on, wax off. Mm -hmm. And then um, he doesn't even understand why the rules there just follows it. And then because he's integrated the rules so well, he can like, oh, this is how I use this. This is nice. This is very good. And then he comes into the, the ha phase. And then later on at the end of the series, he he really makes his own rules. He makes his own fighting moves and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about it like that, um, try entering a karate tournament without ever having done karate. Oh, and it's like you punch people in the face, how hard can it be? Right? You either get disqualified or you get punched in the face or both. Well, and, and to put that into practical advice for people who are like trying to write or get started writing, mm -hmm. like there's a going back to um, Japanese, uh, Japanese meta, like doing stuff mm -hmm. sort of metaphors. There's a go proverb that's like, lose your first hundred games as fast as possible. Because mm -hmm. you aren't going to be good when you start out. Like you just aren't. That's fine. Nobody is right when they start out. Everybody learns. Everybody practices. But like, if you can, for me, I mean, I've written 700,000 words in like eight months or something crazy. Oh, nice. Um, and I have gone from in like maybe two years ago being like, how do dialogue tags work again? Like, <laughs> how often do you use them? Like that level where it's just sort of puzzling over how a sentence works in some ways mm -hmm. to now there's a lot of stuff I'm really just a lot more comfortable with that's pretty acrobatic. Um, mm -hmm. because I've written yeah. so many words down and you have to get those start out with the rules, learn them, I lost but then get second. them ground into your muscle memory and do it with word count. It is time. I've done it. I finally launched Genesis of the Sacred Machine, my own little book in its definitive edition. So if you want to, you can check it out right now on Royal Road. There's a link below the video. Other than that, I really hope you're enjoying this podcast and I could use some of your support. Go check out our Patreon or maybe just leave a like, a follow or whatever it is on the platform that you're on. Anyway, thank you so much and let's get on with the show. While we had this topic of like understanding and learning stuff, um, what's one thing that you learned and either now do differently or would do differently? Um, I am, so I am a very seat of the pants author and mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways in which that has been fine for me. Um, but what I've learned in the past, like probably six months, a year is you can't do it entirely. Um, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I pulled away from that really hard when I first started writing a lot of fiction because I had seen so many people get caught up in world building that they mm -hmm. did not actually get around to writing any stories. They built a lot of worlds and then they were empty little ghost towns of no stories happened, no writing happened. Um, and then over the past, you know, seven novels, I just finished up seven um, today. Um, it, it, it got, I realized that there were, are failings. I needed to actually stop every so often and go, where am I at? Where am I going? what's going to make sense to get me from point A to point B. And I really needed to get that down on paper more. Um, mm -hmm. And that I think is sort of niche. Most people do plan more than I do. So I think it's yeah. sort of niche advice, but just finding out that I couldn't really abandon. Um, here's my beginning. Here's my middle. Here's my end. Here's at least a couple intermediary steps to get me there. And, you know, I, I think in our pre-call recording we talked a little bit about i had to do a big retcon recently yeah i would love to, love, love to hear about that um yes 
I want to like kind of like like juxtapose yeah, yeah. this with my with my own experience with this because I started out as, as, a, as a plotter. I because I thought this is how you do it. I hated it. Uh, I got very stuck, and I was like, "Oh, these characters don't do what I want to do. Uh, this is weird." Uh, then I went complete panzer and just wrote, um, and that then turned into like this rec- recurring loop of like the same emotion over and over and over again because I didn't like re-reference what I did before. It was too much. Um, this also wasn't good. So what I do now is I I kind of have the entire thing plotted out in like very, very like brackish things like this cool scene needs to happen and this, then this, then this, and this. And then while I'm writing, um, I look at the next scene and I basically write a paragraph and then I take each sentence of that paragraph and expand that into another paragraph and then I have a chapter done. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, for example, I like uh, Sam wakes up, um, she walks upstairs, there's, uh, she needs to grab her, grab her weapon, but this and this happens. And then whenever I'm like, oh, wait, this actually needs more space, I actually add even more sentences. I explode these things even more. Um, this actually works super well for me because I don't have to read this stuff and go like, oh, shit. I talked about this like yesterday already. So I need to like redo the entire thing. That saves me a lot of time. But mm-hmm. you were saying retconning. Really would like to hear about that. Yeah, I am. Um, I was writing Demon World Bow Bishop. This was book one. I'm now just mm-hmm. now done with book two. And mm-hmm. it's a very, very soft slice of life, but I'm of the philosophy mm-hmm. that there still has to be a plot in there. There still have to be some mm-hmm. sticks, and they maybe aren't. I'm fighting a pack of dragon wolves with a mace stakes. Like they aren't like that, but there there has to be some some tension, some place the story comes from. So without going too much into spoilers, one of the characters gets ill um Mm -hmm. and a bunch of readers as soon as the character got ill went that came out of nowhere for us there was Mm -hmm. nothing no foreshadowing no nothing and Mm -hmm. and in real life that's how people get sick so i didn't think of it at all when i wrote it like you know i in real life sometimes people just get sick and die in, in a day um but they said as far as the story goes it was a very jarring turn very almost painful to read and like a not not in a dramatic good sense but like in like this chapter was very happy this chapter is very sad and Mm. we had no idea this was coming or even possible in this world so Mm. i had to go back and there were some uh complaints that were related to that so i had to go back and a lot of readers said this there was a group of them who were basically saying yeah we all feel the same way on this and i Felt like I had to respect that. Go back, add in some foreshadowing, change a couple mechanical ways things worked. Mm. Um, And then to do all that in a way where people who didn't go back and read the retcons Mm. would would still be on the same story track. Like Mm. to change details and things in a way where it would then fit without changing the trajectory of the story at all. And Mm. I think it was major changes to two chapters and minor changes to three or four others. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it wasn't you know it wasn't luckily tens and tens of thousands of words but it was good (laughs) you know i mean at least Mm -hmm. i think it was like a day to two days of work oh shit the way i wanted to do it and really figure out where everything had to be adjusted um yeah because i didn't really plan i i wasn't really thinking okay this i knew i was going to have some sort of tension near the end of the Mm -hmm. novel it needed to be there and when I got yeah. close to that point, I decided on it and jumped right in. But because I hadn't planned mm. it and I hadn't done mm. the the mental work on it, it ended up mm. being all in the work and it had to be fixed. Yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense. I, I think this kind of um, thematic foreshadowing is really important, right? Mm. So if people understand at the beginning of the story, when you're doing the promise, that bad things happen here, but it's going to be all right, right? Um, that's a very, very hard promise to make, but it is also very important. So you have about like three or four chapters to like really nail that promise down. Um, yes. And you, I'm partially interested or particularly interested, I should rather say, in the whole retcon thing because I just retconned 36 chapters. Um, yes. 
So I um, I took my uh, took to- uh, the current version of Torchbearer, and that's mm-hmm. on uh, on Royal Road, um, and it has some major problems um, because it basically didn't change from the first version. And I redid the entire start. I chunked out 20, 20 chapters and added 36 and then rewrote the rest of the book. And that didn't take me two days, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a little bit longer. Did but, it but Did it hurt to do? No. It would have no. hurt me. No. That, that like, would have been painful for me to do on some of these. Even if yeah. it was bad and I knew it needed replacing, it would have been painful mm-hmm. for me to cut out the tumor, so to speak. I can see where you're coming from. Um, I thought it would also hurt me way, way more than it did. But it, for me, it was like, just take all the stuff. I know where I need to go now. Like, this is, this, is the, this is the point where I need to integrate. So let's write to this point again. Mm. And then it was like, chucked everything out. I didn't even look at it. I didn't go like deleting it word by word because like, it doesn't make any sense. Go in Scrivener, select everything, copy to, new, to, new, uh, to a different folder, done. Like, let's get, let's get going. And um, then it, I turned those 20 chapters into 36. Um, I added sixty thousand words to the to the novel, um, but it's it's been good. But it took way longer than I thought to integrate those two streams coherently. Yeah. So that people were like, "Oh yeah, okay, I understand this." And even now, I have characters in there that weren't in there before, and events that were important that I probably can reference in the second book because the people who read the first book and don't want to reread the first, it, it again they won't know what's what, what happened there but yeah i'm probably just going to like not mention these people a lot um not the most ideal way but yeah yeah well and and it's i think it's a good compromise because and you seem to have the same instincts to as me on this you have mm-hmm. to respect the experience of the reader mm-hmm. who has been with you the whole time yeah. Um, in those kinds of improvements. And I think yeah. I, I respect the work, man, because there's, if, for me to go back and do that chunk of work again would be, I'm already tired. Um, <laughs> I, Don't tell Travis Baldry. Well, no, because he, he was like, I hate doing work twice. I never do work twice. I'm like, okay, sorry, Travis. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, I, I, there are a lot of writers, I think it would be interesting for me to see how some of the writers I really like a lot who are on that like five a week or seven a week release schedule, mm. how they'd be on a three a week schedule where they did have mm. more revisions and they did have more time to revisit work. Because at, at the pace mm. you have to write to make yeah. it up to the Royal Road and there just isn't time for it for most people. I mean, famously, Shirtaloon. Um, reduced his output from like five chapters a week to three. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he's doing pretty well with that. Yeah. Right. Last, last week I wrote 16, I think. And I had to go back this week and really mm-hmm. reveal very carefully to make sure the quality hadn't slipped. It's just an insane pace. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm in shape. Like, so mm-hmm. to speak, I, I have good writing cardio right now. And even mm-hmm. then it's like, you know, some, you know, back in the day, people would work for years on a single novel. Yeah. 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 And we've, and, got, you know, um, I, I, I write one every month or so. Yeah. And like, I think there's something very particular to like our space, um, which is comparable to like pulp fiction. Right. Um mm-hmm. And like romance and all the, all the kind of stuff, like very easy to churn through kind of stuff. And sometimes I think that maybe I'm, a, I'm also in the wrong space. Um, not like that I don't like it. I love it here. But um, I think that like I should probably think about like submitting my work to a trap publisher. Um, right? They have like shitty rates, but big advances. So um, about the distribution. Be- uh, most popular pulp fiction of all time was written in your home country. Um, it's a book series called Perry Rodan. Oh, Perry Rodan, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it Rodan? Not Rodan, but... Rodan, but he- yeah. It's, 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 it's Perry, Perry Rodan. I've been trying to collect them over the years. I've got like five or six of them on my bookshelf right now. They're fun. I, 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 got, I got a sticker pack. Oh, do you? Mm. That's fun. I, it's, it's, it's super cool, yeah. Like it's, it's for... 
it's um it's a first contact first contact kind of sci-fi story for everyone who's like like going it's been going since like the 60s yeah um very powerful at the beginning very yeah. very much almost like an isekai novel like guy goes to yes. the moon and then stuff kicks off yeah and it's they they wrote different sci-fi very differently back then, and they they rebooted the start also um, because okay. it wasn't didn't hold up very well, and there were lots of like continuity errors, like lots and lots because it wasn't just one dude writing these; it was like an entire series, like an entire team of people, and yeah. some of them had the Superman problem, right? So what can Perry do, and what what can he do? And then they didn't read all the levels before and just wrote something new into that. And um, there's there's the silver. Uh, the silver um, editions, like I think they're calling them, mm-hmm. where someone just goes through all the entire stuff and goes and, and edits everything. Um, and then he was like, well, I saw it, but I had to like kick out this, this, and this. It just, I just couldn't fit into the canon. Like I just couldn't. Like It didn't work. So enjoy the stories. I hope they're nice, but um, this they're not canon anymore. So Yeah. yeah. Uh, they are for, for America, specifically in an American way. What They, they are mm-hmm. German sci-fi hardy boys. They are formulaic, churned out, um, Mm -hmm. super interesting. Not always great, but always fun. Um, They they are fun little 10-minute read. You can burn through one of those novels in like 15 minutes. But Okay, so I think that's like a very, very good point and a very good tagline for lit RPG in general. (laughs) Not always great, but always fun. Yeah, absolutely. I like it. That's a good tagline, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I have another question for you guys, for for you guys, for you, for you guy. <laughs> um, tell me about one book that you love and why is it awesome? I there. I, I'm gonna very. I'm gonna very quickly touch on two. Um, and oh. I mentioned one of these in the pre-call. So go get on his. Go get on the, the uh, Crit RPG Patreon and read. Get all that because he deserves, up. he deserves it. And he's a beautiful. Thank you. Um, I think I should. I mentioned at this point that um, RC Joshua also has a Patreon that you can check out. Yeah, yeah, we do, and we launched a book, which I'll hopefully end a call. Can I plug it? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. So I'll get. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, but uh, right now, um, Warby Pickus's Slum Rat Rising, I think, is mm-hmm. one. It's some of the best writing in the in in the whole realm right now. He's very good. It's always interesting, even when the character is not in the most interesting part of the story, the writing holds it up. Um, I think he's doing masterful work. I really, really like it. Um, the setting is bizarre in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. It is very non-standard, so I don't know if it'll fit for everybody, but the writing will get you um, mm-hmm. and it'll hold you. Um, and I think um, in secondary to that, um, especially the beginning maybe to the first like hundred chapters or so of unintentional cultivator. Yeah. Is it unintentional or unintended? I, I, I should be better. Than... Unintentional. I think. Yeah. It, it, it just very, very good writing in like the cult in like the sort of it's, it's cultivation. So it's not really lit RPG, but you know, you don't always differentiate the two in your heads guys. Um, it's and, progression and, fantasy. Yeah. And and it's and it's really the same thing there. Like especially with cultivation, like everybody's got a lot of the same beats, so it really matters a lot how good the writer is. And this mm-hmm. just whole. I, I, I mean, I'm normally I've dropped cultivation novels by now, and every time it updates, I go good. There it is. Now I can mm-hmm. be happy for fifteen minutes. Um, and, nice. and nice. And I'm a, I am I read for the writing more than I do for the story in a lot of cases, but both of them have, both of those writers have both and are very good. Um, and just real quick, just because he deserves it, even though he's been having some trouble and does not date anything by Robert Blaze, anything he has done is very, very good. Um, and I know he's had some troubles keeping up with pace, but please go encourage Robert Blaze because he is excellent and i don't think he gets the credit he deserves um for a lot of stuff that's jester of the apocalypse i think uh, and yeah and uh the new one lifesteal one percent lifesteal yeah there's um i i forget his name but someone recommended this recently to me um 
a very very old school Roy Road stuff. Um, it's called um, this used to be a this used to be about dungeons. Yeah, uh, Alexander Wales. He did Worth the Candle too. Exactly. Both, yeah, solid writing. Um, mm. l- little bit fetishy for me sometimes. Kinda like right on the line there. It's <laughs> almost here. It's quasi here sometimes. Um, <laughs> oh, but, you said the H word. Oh, <laughs> um, and but it's it's not gross. It's just. It, but I I feel like I I always want to warn people. But I mean, mm. no, I, nobody has done better writing than Wales did at the beginning. Yeah. He had the space to do it and the talent to do it, and he just did yeah. very good work. It's like some of some of his worlds are just like so fucking disturbing like i think some of those worlds would give like matt the nightmares like it's 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 really like if you're if you're into that kind of stuff absolutely it's also not always horror so worth the candle pretty pretty like oh yeah like oof oof it's um that's where i almost stopped reading royal candle because he was good or worth the candle because he was good enough at making a stressful part of the story seem stressful that I got stressed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's talent. That's talent. That's my, you. that's my dungeon crawler card experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, this used to, this, this used to be about dungeons is, is I think a, a bit more chill, like a bit more. Oh chill. yeah. It's slice of life. It's, it's a yeah. lot more chill. I've read the whole thing. It's very, it's, it's solid yeah. all the way through. It's slow. the premise. There is like, you can only go into so many dungeons and after some point you just kind of like, stop going to dungeons because they get too hard and you, you know, go on and have a life and kids and stuff. Yeah. And they're on a, uh, they're very specifically on a D and D hex map. Yeah. So like there's one in every hex, so they have to travel a little bit further every time. And it's, it's character driven um, very much so. And it's intentionally slow and just hmm. it's half slice of life, half action. Yeah. Very good. All right, cool. Well, this brings us to shout outs. I mean, like you also like kind of put shout outs in there, right? So you kind of mix it up a little bit. So yeah. um, you mentioned you wanted to shout out your own books or like like prop your own books. Well, I, so I do. I, I do want to plug them. Um, right mm. now, the big one, if you're looking to support the thing, is How to Survive at the End of the World. That just launched mm-hmm. uh, on Kindle Unlimited, book one and two, with three mm-hmm. shortly to come in the next month or so. Um, any help there, read it, review it, um, would be vastly appreciated. Dead World Isekai is still on Royal Road, all three books, and is free for about another month and a half. So if you want to read it for free, now's the time. If you want to read it on Kindle Unlimited or buy it, that's mm-hmm. coming up pretty soon. Audiobook as well. Um, and right now the new one is Demon World Boba Shop. Um, it is the slice of life if you're looking to calm down. That's the one. Um, and it's very honestly, it is the best stuff I've written so far. So if you're also looking for my current final form, um, it's me writing about a guy making tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, nice. So that sounds very interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, it's good. I, I, it's the one I like the most. I don't actually know if it's the best cause I'm biased mm-hmm. because I like it the most. Yeah. I mean, like we, we talked about, um, writing stuff that you kind of just, chilly enjoy as um as a sort of well palate cleanser between writing about lots of gruesome stuff and i think every author has that i can't wait for for matt's matt matt Deniman's, um like a uh, palate cleanser but maybe that was like kaiju battle surgeon maybe that was his palate cleanser <laughs> i don't know i will never know um but the, the chill vibes of kaiju battle the, the chill, absolutely the man this is it is it, it, it's 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 basically I ran away to evil, just like a little bit more spicy. Um, so um, <laughs> narrated by Heath Miller. <laughs> no, the uh, the next question, or like the not not the next question, but uh, kind of adjacent to that, is um, did you did you see that Matt Dinaman got like a trad published contract? Um, I, I I heard a little. I've been deep writing the last couple weeks so i haven't seen a ton Mm. but i heard scuttlebutt i i i I saw a little bit of it Mm. um that's which is fantastic for him absolutely and i'm assuming is it is it something fill me in is it something new yes it's um i think 
I distinctly remember something about like a, like a farmer's riot on some sort of planet. So it's, it's a sci-fi thing. Mm. Um, and it's, it's standalone. It's like one book. Um, and rumors abound about the exact specific amount of money he got for it, but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, good, yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, let's, man, yeah. Let's, all, let's all do a lot eventually. Let's, let's all do a lot of money, yeah. Like, I, I just kind of hope that, like, in the coming years, the RPG will retain this kind of free-for-all feeling. Um, because it's 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 going away. Um, all the big publishers don't really have that much. Like, we're all booked out. There's just so much stuff, right? So, Athon's pretty at capacity. Uh, I think Royal Guard's at capacity. Um, Podium, I know for a fact, are at capacity. Um uh, mm-hmm. Or like getting pretty close to it, I should say. I, I shouldn't speak for for publishers, but um, all right. So there's new publishers popping up everywhere because there's plenty of work going around. But also at some point there's going to be market saturation. So we'll see. Yeah. Right. Well, and and I think it goes one to two ways. Either mm-hmm. it explodes into a more mainstream thing, and then there's room again, and more readers. I mean, the big winners will still win big, but there will be more to get. Um, or it just stays sort of at the side it is, and the big winners stay the big winners, and maybe every once in a while one of them retires. Yeah, I mean that's that's, or maybe not, right? So, um, I think rand- randomly Ghost Hound recently finished. Mm-hmm. So it's done. Um, and I know that um, he who fights with monsters isn't done. I, I think it's going to take a long time to get it done. But the series will have an end at some point. All right. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not, not an endless series, even though sometimes it looks like it. Well, but, um, what I hate to say, because I wish that there was a way to cheat this, um, really, really good stuff will always win. It doesn't matter yeah. how saturated the market is. It doesn't. If I was writing true masterpieces, generational mm-hmm. works, like, mm-hmm. you know, I guess. Yeah, maybe, right? It's. Um, there's a lot of luck involved too, right? So it's mm-hmm. about um, it's about finding the right market for your stuff, and then um, first of all, being lucky enough to know where your right market is, and then the right people reading that. Like my biggest uh, biggest um, example for how luck plays um, plays a huge role is uh, biggest Nicholas Wolfwood. You know, him? Uh, I know, I know, I probably do. Um, I have an inability to remember most names very easily. It's uh, you. Maybe you don't. Um, he's a Twitter guy who has a Trigon Maximum fan account, oh. and he um, was tweeting about the new upcoming live action thing, and then he tweeted out. like, hmm? "Oh we'll- yeah, by the way, go and read this book." Don't read anything about it. Just go and read it right now. Stop anything. And he posted a picture of... Um, I don't want to butcher her name. Anyway, the book's called uh, This is How You Lose a Time War. It's a novella. Pretty short. And it won the, I think, Hugo Award like a couple of years ago. And overnight, that thing got like millions of retweets. And that book shot from like, I don't know, like spot... 10,000 or something up to like number one on Amazon, like up the charts, right? And it became this this huge self-propagating viral sensation, right? The other example that I have is, have you read Cradle? Uh, Actually, no, believe it or not, it's on my list to read because I've been trying to get enough time to start it. But everyone has heard about Cradle, right? Even... uh, even if you don't like it, like everyone's like, but have you read Cradle? Uh, it's because it's it's always a meme, right? And at some point, the the joke, like, just I don't know, like this guy probably will write earned a lot of money with Cradle, uh, and I, I'm I'm doing a joke and say like half of it is because people want to be another joke, um, right? So luck plays a huge role in this. We talked before we talked the bonus stuff, um, or before the bonus stuff, I think even. Um, about how certain authors just were at the right place at the right time, mm-hmm. right? Um, and they're the first to admit it. Um, so you got to have everything. Good story, um, 
decent enough skills for people to not hate the story and um, luck that people talk about it, right? If the if a certain amount of catalysts, so people who talk about what they like or early adopters, like very vocal early adopters, hit your story soon and then start posting about it on like on these threads on on Reddit, like, oh, hey, I like this book. This was really nice. Um, you're going to like slowly but surely gain a following and that then self perpetuates. Um, it's super, it's super easy being like, yeah, this is YouTube talk. I will everything watch. And he said like, it's super easy being a billionaire. It's never been harder to be a millionaire mm -hmm. to become a millionaire. Right. So, um, you, yeah. 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 You just gotta wait. Yeah. And by the way, any influential tweeters in the audience, please feel free to <laughs> rocket me to fame and, sure, and sure, that's sure, ridiculous sure. fortune because, you know, sure. I got, I got sure. nothing but time for that. And when you get super famous, of course, you're going to like retweet yeah. the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to, I'll put it, I will put it in the back of the next book I put up on uh, KU. Wonderful. I'll tell, I'll tell my editor like please please put in a plug for crit rpg and yeah you know and we'll... i mean you can you can you can like put it in the, in the in the front like dedicated to crit rpg the podcast that made me famous um that sounds like a very good idea that's um that, yeah when i'm giving the state of the union address for the u.s i will be like by the way yeah, yeah. Crit RPG. rc joshua poet laureate there you go <laughs> all right so this has been the crit rpg podcast enough nonsense um, usually I would say we're going to keep talking after this podcast is over, but we've already talked a lot before the podcast started. So probably this is going to be a bit shorter of a post show. Nevertheless, I really hope you enjoyed the show. Um, please do give a like, a follow, rate it on iTunes or, um, uh, Spotify. That also helps a lot. Um, good ratings. Of course, bad ratings don't help a lot, but it's your choice. I feel hurt. <laughs> um, yeah. RC, any last words? Uh, I, we covered most of it, but I, I really appreciate you having me here, and it's yeah. been a whole lot of fun. No worries. Dude. Like, I really enjoyed the podcast, too. Like, it was really, really good. Like, um, we talked, like I said, about a lot of things. Yeah. And yeah, if I didn't have this like this like work meeting in a, in a couple of minutes, um, I totally would like keep going with this. Oh yeah, but absolutely. Well, and hit me hit me up anytime you need another episode. I got <laughs> it's a nice little break from the typing. Yeah i I really wish I had more time to like bring people on again. Mm -hmm. Um, but right now it's like doing one of these episodes is um, so it's the time and hours times two multiplied by the amount of people in the podcast so um right sometimes like when i do these these um uh, round table discussions with with all the all the huge names uh, about writing uh, sometimes these take like eight hours to edit um, and that's my entire day done uh, so this podcast will take about four hours to edit so we'll see well it is immensely appreciated like yes. dearly so thank you I'm doing it for fun. Like it's still fun for me, and I'm still very much enjoying it. Okay, cool. Well, with that being said, thank you again very much for being here, and um, thank you for listening and or watching. And I'll see you next time. And if you're on Patreon, the show goes on for a little bit at least. <laughs>